Glory, glory, hallelujah. It's another episode of Audio Mullet. And guess what? There, lurking in the bushes, with goat blood all over his chin, dripping in his mucus and saliva, staring at us with glowing neon green eyes. It's Mike Nelson, the Chupacabra. And in that corner, Doug Tenaple, the alpha male. And it's me. <laughs> it's me, the beta. <laughs> Ethan Nicole. How's it going? Ethan Nicole. This is Audio Mullet. <laughs> oh, we fully embraced it. I love it. <laughs> We're I all the here. Goat I, I just it love that like you were, you were introducing Mike from uh, coming back from altered states for a second. We had the goat blood on his mouth. I like that it's alpha, beta, chupacabra, uh, ABC. I'll yeah, ABC. It. What the? All be, always be chupacabraing. <laughs> Is there a point? I mean, I think I would be excused by anyone if this uh, the coronavirus goes any further. If I am, you know, sucking the local goats dry of their blood. Like, look, I had to feed myself and my family. Yeah, you're being yeah. fair. It's true. Yeah, I regurgitate the blood back into Bridget's mouth. This is completely normal, people. Like a Why baby bird, com- like feeding yes. baby birds. Yeah. Like you get Chinese people eating from- baby birds. It happens. No. <laughs> I got my own wet market going on. The Corona Lyrus. Oh. Mm. The, the Bologna virus. That's what wow. I call it. Wow, Doug throwing fraud. truth bombs down already. What a fraud. He's bringing it. <laughs> we'll, going. we'll get to that later. We'll get to the good stuff later. First, how's your week? Ethan, what are you doing? Oh, well, you know, it's just more of the same sitting around the house. Stir crazy. Kids are going insane. The park is like the, the park is like all taped off with police tapes. So they can't even play at the park now. They can't do anything. We just have to like. They just have to scream and beg to watch more movies, and we're, we we have to have play this tug of war of like, well, three movies is already a lot of movies, and then you know, it's all day. That's it. That's our life so, right now. So managing kids just slightly different under and virus and world. But you don't, to, you don't gotta. I don't gotta drive my kids anywhere. That's the best thing. <laughs> I got back like two hours a day. Angie and I did not having to oh, drive yeah. them all over to every school activity. Four kids. Yeah, but driving them away, isn't that kind of then, one then of the best gone. points of your day? Yeah, no, then they're gone. No, they, they just, they're, these kids are low maintenance, man. They're oh, easy. Lucky. His are at you're a great lucky, age. Man. Yeah, yours are at a great Ours are very, they were just hitting like finding friends, especially Eliza. She found a little neighbor friend and now like they never play together because everybody's all isolated. Uh, this reminds me, home. so being with without children you know, where you're just with, I'm with my wife, my children are gone. We mm-hmm. talk to them. We obviously know what's up, but it reminded me of my, one of my favorite stories that my dad told is that he worked with a guy at a factory who said he left for his eight hour shift and his wife was sitting at the kitchen table, smoking uh, her Marlboros and crushing them out into a little ashtray and had a bottle of whiskey next to her. And he, he's like, you know, everything okay. She's like, I'll tell you later. <laughs> and then he came, he came home after his, after his shift and she was in the same position. The ashtray was doubled that and the whiskey Luke. was almost gone. And she went, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and then she left him. <laughs> and that was it. And the image of that is one of my favorite stories. I'll she take sat that there as a the no. entire time. Wow. Things aren't good. I'll take it. So anyway, Al, she left me. I guess she doesn't love me anymore. Now, your boys are grown men. (laughs) Yes, my boys are grown men. One is married. The other has a serious girlfriend. So they're both, you know, sort of they're surrounded by by loved ones. So they're they're good. They're fine. They don't need us. Hmm. Good. That's a sense of pride. Which is the state you want your children to be in. Yeah, that's self-sufficient. Yep. Success. Ah, must feel so good. So I think we have a lot of topics. Ethan, do you think we should start with, I just raised this one and this is a sensitive one, but I talked off air about it and I'll, I'll raise it here. And I don't care if it's sensitive. This is a sensitive time. Here's the issue. Uh, What do you guys think? Have you experienced this as well? Is that I'm concerned, obviously, as every human being who has been jailed right now, we're all in jail. This has never been done before, being jailed by your own government. Your rights have been taken away, and that may be for a good cause. We don't know yet. But when I raise the issue of, is it wise? Hold hold on, before you finish, uh, I already have my answer. Death penalty. (laughs) For stepping out of the... Uh, Just automatic, full... Full nuclear spray, automatic death penalty for all. That's my answer. 
Oh, well, that would certainly solve it. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Now, now finish your question, Alex. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's just that, so one day we woke up and we had civil rights. We no longer have them. We all understand why that is. Mm-hmm. But to even raise the question of, is it wise to jail the entire, because, I mean, it's functional jail, right? You have some rights, but you basically have... I mean, they most of them have been taken away by fiat. And that, again, that may be understandable. We don't know. But to even raise the issue, I've had dear friends get very, very angry at me. There seems to be a ton of passion around the just do what you're told. How dare you even question this thing? And I'm mm-hmm. puzzled by that. And that's my only I'm that's my very modest discussion point. I don't get the the. The good, bad, negative, whatever of the points. I, I, it's just the anger around the even saying it mm-hmm. uh, because you become a monster going, do you want to kill people? And it's like, I no, but I mean, this is obviously this state is going to kill uh, many, many people. We don't know. So it's my unknown versus your unknown deaths. And why are you the moral uh, but yours high ground? Is wrong. Yours Mine is, is wrong. dead wrong. And I'm a monster. And I just don't understand that position. So. That's my topic. Have you guys experienced this? Yes. Okay, good. Oh. <laughs> I feel I, slightly I isolated friends, by it. We're just normal artists, whatever, and they all have avatars. Not all of them, but some of them have avatars that say like, stay the F home. Like just <laughs> pushing the quarantine big brother, they live message. Stay the F home. Mm-hmm. Like use the F word. Oh, as emphasis. Wow. Bold. That's how serious. It's, this ain't a gray area. Stay the F home. I'm like, how about you shut the F up? <laughs> oh, how about dang. I go outside wherever the F I want? <laughs> Who I didn't vote for you. I love the the argument that what cracks me up the most about the argument is you take any of those, you know, you, people post this big, long speech, you know, like, how dare you consider the how convenience dang. and that you just, just for money and convenience and for prosperity that you would let thousands die just so that you can have your job and your, your life. And I'm like, but is this a, is this about abortion? What are they talking about? It sounds like they're yeah. talking about abortion. <laughs> <laughs> just so you can have exactly your- the argument for abortion is like, we will kill millions so that we can have our convenience and our jobs and our you know, live the way we want to. (laughs) Yeah. That is the precise. Exact. Hold up the mirror. people. (laughs) Well, we're, it's a confederacy of idiots, Mike, my, I, I just assume we all want to be cowed. We want to be coddled. We want to be told what to do. And you sticking out as someone not willing to do that. You're a threat. You're what's wrong with everything. Well, I guess it, it, mostly it's the disappointment over, is this really the, the land of the free and the home of the brave where no one even questions it? Like, and, and in fact, everyone goes East German Stasi on you? Like, that guy's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And I, I mean, you know, I, I understand there are places where there, this thing is serious and it's obviously I understand this. I'm not even going to go through it. But mm-hmm. what I'm saying is in, uh, in Minnesota, there's very, very few cases of it comparatively. Um, again, I know it's also, uh, horrible to compare it to the flu. I know it's worse than the flu. I understand, but here there's just not that many cases of it. And so to, Treat every place as like we're locking down mm-hmm. the United States of America and jailing every single citizen. And people say, well, you're using, uh, you know, inflamed language there. Like, well, what is we're in home jail. There's no there's no other way to say it. We're we are not allowed to travel. And I is just there say, anywhere is there, that. Sorry. Is there no, anywhere they're actually enforcing? Like if you're like out walking the streets, whatever they would like. They would get yes. a fine or yeah, anything? there are. There are. I think Minnesota is probably a little more lax. Minneapolis, the city has said we will prosecute. I haven't heard uh, of cases of it, but they they made a very strong statement like you are mm. not to move. Yeah, they, uh, they have state uh, guards clo- making sure that bars are remaining closed and they'll close them. I think that was yeah. in, uh, Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, something like that. Yeah. Something so, I mean, we're not we're not. Area. Again, to be clear, we're not France where they actually you have to actually have your papers and you are stopped. And uh, and in the UK, they're encouraging people to report on their neighbors. 
which, yeah. you know, some places <laughs> are here as well. I think the AG of Michigan said, report your neighbors if they're if you suspect they're gathering or whatever. Mm. Um, and that's just a weird state. That's to wake monstrous. Up to. So to to, you know, go to sleep as a free citizen and to wake up as a, uh, you know, uh, under essentially martial law. I know that there's not troops on every corner. I'm not being, but you know, that is the essence of it. Like self-imposed martial law is a weird state. And so Mm -hmm. to question it is not bizarre and it's not monstrous. This is a weird time. And so this is the time to discuss these things. And I'm frustrated with people who shut me down saying that I'm a monster for even bringing them up. That's that's all I'm saying. That's, that's why we bring mind. them up, because this is audio mullet where we <laughs> uh, in dedication to the hairstyle that never should have gone out of style. But it's a little nerdy and a little out of fashion. But we give a, a, a defense of old things here on audio mullet. And freedom is a very old thing. And so is ratting out your friends to the state and voluntarily <laughs> giving up your freedom. That needs to go out of style qu- quicker than the mullet. I would say, though, isn't this the time for the mullet? Because we can't even get haircuts. Yeah, yeah the so going out. Yeah. So just take the uh, what do you do? The number uh, four, the like the well, the biggest trimmer across the top of your head, but leave the back <laughs> just growing. Number four on top, number one on the sides and back. Right. So we'll all have mullets by the end of this. I'm doing it. Do the stair yeah. steps. Yeah. Well, yeah. Big you, mullet. Your head is perfect for a mullet, Mike. When I when I Photoshopped that mullet on you, is like it was like a glove. It just was perfect. It oh, flowed. man. I'm going to do it now. Yeah. Because I still can have a mullet aura. Your hair already wants to be there, even though you keep it trim. I am lucky that I I do have hair all over my head, which was never, you know, it was always in doubt. When you look at your relatives like Mm -hmm. grandpa was bald, Uh, you know, she's my grandma had thinning hair. But all right. So I'm going to go bald, whatever. I'm, I'm lucky I do have hair all over my head. So, yeah, I should just go for it. Yeah. Before I die. Like those, you know, rock stars. Like I just saw yeah. Sammy Hagar. He's 72 years old. He still has Sammy Hagar hair. It's like, <laughs> is that possible? Is that a wig? Are you pulling on a wig every day? But probably <laughs> not. You know, he's just a dude with his own hair. Hmm. I love it. Ethan, grow yeah. your hair out. <laughs> All right. Are yeah. you going to grow your hair out, Ethan? It's been growing. I mean, I haven't had a haircut in a while. So I got, I have like a mini mullet going in the back right now. So I could do one of those little tiny. Like kind of like the hat hair mullet where it's it's just shaved to fit your hat on. You know, have you ever seen those redneck? Oh yeah, yeah, yep. Like the bangs are there, and then the back hair's there, and everything else is shaved. The Joe dirt. <laughs> yeah, the Joe. You, you are not allowed to get a haircut. <laughs> they have been yeah, prohibited they're, they're, by the state. They're <laughs> suffering. The, so my biggest thing is, Mike, your this is okay. State sh- state locking down things is one thing. Yes. What's more troubling to me is the free friends who are carrying the water of the state and voluntarily doing their job. Like people always talk about like the fear of censorship, da, da, da. I don't fear censorship from the government. We get far more censorship from culture and from our peers. Like they will shame the living hell out of you if you uh, just speak say the wrong thing. For instance, we've talked a little bit about the gay marriage thing. You say the wrong thing. I don't fear what the state's going to do. I fear what the studios and the audience is going to do. The mob. The mob Mm. will take away your work. They will shame your name so you can't wear your name anymore. They will report you to Twitter to get you knocked out on Twitter. Twitter doesn't know what it's doing. It's too, the the Leviathan is too big right now to see it all. So when you want to leave your house, for instance, I have a a Bigfoot Bill 2 is now on Indiegogo. We just reached 110,000 today. If I put put an avatar right now on my Facebook page that was the opposite of my friends that said, stay the F home. And I said, uh, ignore the F out of quarantine. Go outside. (laughs) I would lose money on Bigfoot Bill 2. And so even though I very much believe against the quarantine, I'm not going to say anything about it because I want money and I don't <laughs> yeah. want my friends to, uh, to shame me. That's what we all go through. Normal people go through. Right. Yeah. And I, I and, um, and I think especially with young people, here's what I fear. And again, I don't, none of us know the future, 
none of the models predicting the deaths know the future. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, casting those chicken bones on the ground is just as stupid as anything else. So I'm as free to guess it as any epidemiologist. And I hate the fact that people say, are you an expert? Do you know, are you an (laughs) epidemiologist? It's like, no, neither are you, but I'm a free person in America Mm -hmm. and we're not run by epidemiologists. Let's just start a country where epidemiologists and climatologists are the kings and they tell us what to do then. If that, if that's how you want to live, (laughs) then let's do that. But, uh, I don't know either, but I do know that I, all of a sudden, all of my civil rights are gone. And to make a peep about that is to be, like, be a good citizen, step in line. I, I don't know. I, I just I'm I'm very, very troubled by it. And I think that young people will be uh, they will say in the future when the next wave of, oh, well, we got to lock everyone down. Sorry, it's a date. We're keeping you safe. We're protecting you. Please stay indoors will be for something very even more minor than this. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying this is minor. I know people just I'm saying that this, you know, I, I predict and here's my prediction. It'll end up like a very bad flu season. OK, mm-hmm. that's bad. That's very, very bad, because in 2018, is it the 1718 flu season? 80,000 people died per CDC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it'll reach that. It might. And that's horrible. Obviously, you guys, obviously. You guys see my share screen right now. Can you see? Uh, let me check. Uh, let me look here. Take a look. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm on the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Emerging Infectious Diseases page. Yes, I got you. Yep. This is uh, about the estimating the risk of death from the 2019 novel coronavirus disease, China, January to February 2020. I, I started reading this and I went down to this here math equation. Can you see that? <laughs> wow. Yeah, gotcha. Here's here's where when you say like no one understands, <laughs> here's the case fatality ratio. We define crude CFR as the number of cumulative deaths divided by the number of cumulative cases as a specific point in time. To estimate CFR in real time, we use the delay from hospitalization to death, H to the S, which is assumed to be given H to the S equals H, S in parentheses minus H, S minus one, four, S greater than zero, where H, (laughs) S in parentheses is a cumulative density function of the delay from the hospitalization to death and follows a gamma distribution with mean 10.1 days and SD 5.4 days obtained from the available observed data if pi A T OS, the same delay, time delay, adjusted CFR on reported day. What the what? <laughs> Look at this math You're equation. You're layman. You don't understand all that. It's yeah. got a, a bunch of enigma this, symbols or whatever that, that yeah, is. That, that, that's crazy. This scares me. This is why we shut everything down? Math. This is... Well, we shut everything down from that guy, Ferguson, at the London School, right? Because he said 2.2 million people would die. And again, like maybe he's going to be right. He, no, he's every, wrong. You know, I think like a hundred thousand people Mike. would have to die every day for that to to make it work. But that got everything to you know everyone put those models up, and all governors went on lockdown because of it. And again, it will it be smart? I don't know. The but deaths from the financials will yeah. be greater. When you shut down America's economic engine around, they say, we get a cold, the world gets a flu. Mm -hmm. We're literally, by shutting down our economic engine, we're going to just gut probably 23rd world countries. They will starve to death. Yes, that is for sure. That is, there's no question about that, that people working at manufacturing or whatever will starve to death. Well, they don't get pay rent. They die. Employment over there? What? What? Weird. I'm, well, I'm saying they'll freeze to death. They can't. They can't buy yeah. fuel. They can't buy food. It'll screw up the world market. No, I mean, it like is. There's so much. It's complete white privilege that, <laughs> right? It's or at least American. I mean, process, prosperity privilege. Like the, the idea that you could just sit at home and be fine for a few months and not work. And it's uh, the people that say Americans hate brown people that actually hate brown people by killing more of them once again. It's the people saying don't. But uh, don't go outside and don't go to your job. It's like this job. It's not just about money. 
Mm -hmm. uh, as Thomas Sowell says, right? It's all trade-offs. Isn't that what he said, Ethan? You're the Thomas Sowell guru. I can't remember that specific. It's been a while. It's it's one of his big economic principles that that, that there are no freedoms. There's only trade-offs. So, Mm. for instance, you you don't drive five miles an hour, even though that would completely eradicate uh, collision deaths. If everyone Mm -hmm. had to drive five miles an hour and you made it a law, you could say, well, why don't you do it? Because there really is a, a scale being weighed Mm-hmm. of certain things that you do that will cost more lives somewhere else. Hmm. Dollar, There really is a dollar cost benefit to life. I hate to put it in that crude of a statement, but if things go a certain way financially, other things do get triggered. And I don't think you can disrupt the American economy this way for this many quarters and just pretend like, oh, it's just me going out, going without a, a, a few luxurious items that I want to buy at Walmart that they've uh, quarantined off. Mm-hmm. Like, well, right. Essentials that is, only. That is a false uh, is a false argument. And everyone has to acknowledge. I mean, you know, in the same way, it's like the, the death penalty thing. OK, you have this pure thing that we can have the death penalty. I'm not arguing the I'm not wanting to bring the argument itself in here, but people die on the other end of it, too, from people who are released from prison. There are recidivists who go out, they murder again. So you please acknowledge that people die because of your view and Mm, people are dying because of this view. And that's, you know, again, that's what we're talking about. And we don't know how many people are dying and we don't know how many people are going to die of COVID. So that's the problem is you have two unknown variables. Right. Two unknowns. And then it comes down to confirmation bias. I, I believe it. You're the, mm. both sides are theorizing. I only know the people most likely who are most tied to culture. I'm not even saying people who are most against Trump. The people who are most cowed and tied to culture, the ones most likely to stay, say, stay the F home. It seems like a majority of philosophies that people carry today are not about it's not about evidence stacking up it's about what it makes them look like and i feel like that's that's just what it is you don't want to be the one who's because what if you're wrong so the safest thing to do is to be it's 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 like selfie philosophy you know it's coming from a place of virtue signaling this is you know this 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 year's rainbow it doesn't matter if it's true or not (laughs) yeah well here's but here's one more danger do you think for a moment I feel like, look, a a lot of people working on the front lines, obviously, I think the vast majority of them are very concerned people who are doing their best or working many, many hours a day. And so I stand back and applaud. And I'm all of that is that's, of course, Uh, uh, and even the the governors issuing this, I think they think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. However, you the three of us know human nature. do you think that they're ever going to give up this power once they have it? Like I can shut down everything yeah. by fiat. I can wake up and go, "Hey guys, danger today! Everyone stay in." And do you think that they won't use this again? Of course, yeah. this will be used again, and of course, the arguments will be, "We're keeping you safe." And it's the you know, it's the Ben Franklin thing. The people who give up their uh, uh, liberty for the sake of safety will have neither. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just I fear that. And, and if anyone thinks that they are totally benevolent and will go, no, this time when the flu comes through, we're letting this pass. You are insane. They will use this whenever they feel like it for whatever political purposes they feel are best. They will use this. It will be used again. I do like how all of our discussions are about how the world is just circling down a drain. <laughs> <laughs> no matter it what really is the. It Three really old guys is. in a back porch. <laughs> it really is. We're all done. We're all done. Because, Mike, it's not even they, the state, that I fear when they see the exercise of their power. It's we're the, the mob, we the culture, our peers, your neighbors. We're the ones being trained to freely concede that power, though no one came out with a law and said, we voted and we passed a law that said Costco shall only sell essentials. They're like, this is an emergency. Remove habeas corpus. There's no law. We're just going to go in and just buy caveat, tell you all these things to do. And you, the stupid sheep, will just... Repeat it to each other and peer pressure each other into this thing. That's the Orwell message is that the, the, the final conflict is that you, you 
turn in your own girlfriend, your own wife, your own neighbor right. <laughs> for, for Big Brother. Big Brother's already assumed he's evil. The state's already gone, but they can't do what they do unless you, all of us, concede and peer pressure each other into doing it and really go after each other's jobs for it, turn each other in for it. And we're just, that's the, that's the power that we're being conditioned. And that's why it's already over. We already see it. It's over. But I mean, it's not a surprise to us because we know human nature, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's not. Yeah, this is old. This isn't new. Right, right. This is not new at all. I, uh, I, how, how can I tell this story without getting too specific? Uh, let me just say that someone younger than me. Make it about Casually. Dogs. Sorry. <laughs> casually death dismissed. Death penalty. Um, Give them the death penalty. <laughs> Casually dismissed religious freedom in a way that chilled me to my blood. Like, mm. I, like you, uh, well, it's pretty clear. Those are the orders from the governor. And like, I, I'm going to go record the, uh, f- you know, the Good Friday message at my church. So I guess I'm violating the thing. I don't think it's essential to leave the house. I don't think you should do that, said a young person who I know very, very, very well. Like, beneath wow. the wheel, the person casually, rolled beneath Herman Hess's wheel. Casually removing all uh, freedom to assemble. And like you, this is not good. You shouldn't do this. And it shocked me and chilled me like, wow, that is true. Uh, I think that young people will will casually assent to. I've always said they will. It'll be a friend of mine who will lead me into the death camp and go, no, man. Dude, yeah. it's all chill. It's cool. It's cool. Good. We're just going to go just, this way, man. You just be reeducated, man. It's cool. Put Here your girl up sack over your head, bro. Yeah. No, it's you got a Nike good, swoosh on it. Yeah. Awesome, man. Here you go. The whirring knives are over there. It's cool. Right over there. It's cool. Plastic We're making some Mike hamburger. <laughs> I'm going to have a Mike burger. You're going to be feeding me and my family. Nothing personal. You're going to help my family. We need this. Awesome, dude. Let me shake your hand before you go in there, man. Hey, can I get an autograph? I, I'm a huge fan of riff tracks. Wow, I'm a huge fan. I've heard that your the pads of your thumbs are the most delicate parts that I'm going to eat. Can I have those first? Man? <laughs> Great, man. First, Sweet. Thanks. Just sign Sweet, them. Dude. Sign them. And I'll, when I eat them, I'll eat your signed thumb. <laughs> Soylent green is you, dude. It's awesome. <laughs> it's not even men. It's not even humans. It's Mike Nelson. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be the friend. Uh, that That is the greater fear and the greater horror to Orwell. Is uh... By the way, I just heard a cool, cool quote from the Chesterton guy. That Chesterton's um, Napoleon Dale. of Notting Hill is written uh, in the year. Uh, it's about the future that... Uh, Chesterton's writing it and and he has it take place in 1984 and Orwell apparently was a huge Chesterton fan and and he read him all the time and that's why oh. he said 1984 and 1984 was because of Chesterton once wow. again oh nice well I can link into that in a an extremely hilarious way sure Bridget and I went to we broke out of our home jail we busted all the laws we evaded put, put the uh, sky cops and the drones that were following us. So we went to the pickleball court, which is like two blocks down from us <laughs> to get some exercise. And as we're pulling in, there's a Chesterton Academy right there. And Dale what? Alquist was unloading some stuff from his what? van. Oh, yeah, because you guys live right by Dale. Wow. Right. So he, uh, Bridget rolls down the window and goes, hey, uh, uh, Dale, Mike and Bridget, how you doing? And he looks at us, he's super happy guy. And he goes, mm-hmm. hey, great, how are you? And, and I turn to Bridget and I go, he doesn't know who I am, you know. <laughs> and she just assumes that I know him because I've, I run the Chestertonians and we've interviewed him and I read yeah. his books. She's like, and he says, great, well, God bless you guys today. Have a great day. He was just being so nice. Mm-hmm. He was being nice. And then we got out and then we talked to him for like five minutes and just said, and Bridget was also like bringing food to these um, uh, sequestered Italian uh, priests who were in this building that he was in. Yeah. And so she said, I know I have to bring food to these guys later today who are quarantined. And so we talked to him and then eventually I said, Dale, I, you don't remember me. This is an odd, <laughs> but I did a, a, an interview with you. A while ago, and I know you've done a hundred of them. I'm just trying to remind. He's like, oh, oh, okay, and I can tell he did not remember. He still who didn't I was. remember. Yeah, which he is fine. Audio but I said, yeah, I mean, no, he didn't. He didn't remember it. And I wow. just said, 
I'm, I'm do, and I happened to do a Zoom Chesterton that night, and I said, "We're doing that, so if you want to join us." And he was cheerful and everything. But anyway, it was just he said, like "Yeah, a, yeah, I'll show up." And then he instantly yeah, sure. forgot. Bridget just does the thing; like everyone knows who I am, of course. So, uh, but <laughs> I was sitting there, and he was just—he went along with the whole thing. Great guy. It was a very funny encounter, but. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you guys are playing pickleball. Oh, great. <laughs> he was more excited about pickleball than yes. riff tracks as any man should. <laughs> yes, of so course. If you ever get the chance, like, because I know he said he wanted to meet. I mean, that's weird. But sitting it down and having a cigar with him and talking Chesterton to the guy just knows the depth. Yeah. It's just like, it's great. Me and Eric got to do oh, that. I think I think we can get him on a uh, we'll we'll get him on again or we'll. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. If the world survives this, you know, maybe we'll sit down and have a cigar with him at some oh, point. Oh, that'd be lovely. I got yeah. I to get a hold of him because I'm supposed to do a Chesterton uh, lecture on orthodoxy. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're doing orthodoxy right now for our Chestertonian. So. Yeah. I got to do a kind of an outline. In fact, it's the same day as my surgery. So now I got to push that, I think. I'm going to have to push that. Well, yeah, give us a, on before the top- we do the next topic, give us an update on the oh. surgery. Oh yeah, uh, I have I have melanoma melanoma on my face on my cheek. They're going to cut two to three inches of it out. Uh, two to three inches. Oh yeah, so he's going to have see a your hole jaws. In, I'm going to look like Michael Jackson when they're done. You're going to look like <laughs> Two Face from the Nolan movies, but like both sides. Yeah, both sides. No, just one side. Just one side's going to get hacked, and uh, so they have to make sure they have clear borders on that. That's why they do at least uh, two to three inches. Oh, and then they just Frankenstein stitch you up and no, they don't. They leave you. They, they do like a a half job sewing it up because within four days you go see a plastic surgeon and they do either a graft or what's called a J flap where they cut another piece of skin next to it and just stretch it on over. They give a graft on that pig skin. Yeah. And on that same day, they have like this big five hour test where they are going to test two spots on my lymph nodes. They're going to go in and take some lymph node tests. And that's when we find out if it's bad or not. Wow. Is the I lymph thought you node. knew already that it wasn't, but that's the day that you do. No, you don't know until you check, until you go into those nodes. They, they, uh, they wow. pump a bunch of ink in so they can find them uh, on the little metal ink or something so they can find them on the, uh, the scan. Hmm. because apparently they're hard to locate and they don't want to go into a carotid artery around your neck. So they find them and then they, uh, they just do a little biopsy and they look for a percentage of cells. And I said, Hey, you know, not to be paranoid or anything, but how often do you get a false negative? Like where you, you it looks like there's nothing in there, but really it's full of cancer. They go, Oh, less than 2%. Hmm. I go, Oh, so it's slightly less deadly uh, then, I mean, malignant mal- melanoma is is more deadly than the coronavirus. <laughs> and, and if they find and if they find cancer in the lymph nodes, then you have a sixty five percent chance of survival huh. for five years. So, corona. This is why I just see it as a giant fart. <laughs> this, is, this is I'd take that and they're going like oh and we had to push your biopsy back by four weeks because of the state oh, mandate wow, four yeah. weeks so instead of waiting four weeks I had to wait eight weeks because hmm. it's non-essential uh, emergency surgery hmm. so now if it spreads even farther I will have been killed by media hysteria and the state my true enemies <laughs> good job Oh, dear. Uh, Doug, I mean, what can we say? We we can't do without you, so you will yeah. survive. That's all I can say. Oh, yeah. My my job is to survive. We'll find out. So it's not bad news till I find out if it's bad news. So after June, we'll know. How do you how do you live with it day to day? Are you I'm happy, uh, happier than I've ever been, man? I'm so ready to, you know, we have a death wish. So I'm so <laughs> ready to go that and just so at peace with God in his plan that I'm like, if this is how you want, you've numbered my days, then let's go. And if this is not the way you've numbered my days, then thank you and I'll take the take the cure. Hmm. But I'm, I'm 100% confident on that. I'm totally at peace if this is going to be it. And I've lived my life most days like it was the last day of my life anyways. For most of my life, I just don't, uh, I don't count the cost. I've always felt like I was, I was on death's door. 
Never thought I'd make it to 53. So, yeah, mine, mine was 24. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never especially, thought I'd live past that. Especially once you pa pass Jesus' life at 33, I feel like I got to live longer than God in a body. <laughs> right. So, how can right. I complain? <laughs> and it's kind of implied if you don't do it by the time you're 33, you know, Jesus, uh, Jim, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Don't do your big thing. Oh, the, the 27 Farley. Club. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, if you don't do it by the time you're 33, you're not going to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actuarially speaking, the, every year that you live increases your chances of living more years. It may seem obvious, but that's how the actuaries look at it. Oh, you're this old? Oh, you'll probably live much older then because you made it to now. Because <laughs> you made it this far. Right. Yeah. 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 They, they already threw their best at you. And uh, and you're still alive. So, anyways, even the even the, the quarantine and the hysteria even even hits has far reaching consequences, deadly consequences because of this little fad, this tiny little flu, this tiny little <laughs> Wuhan flu. <laughs> what a what a placebo! What a placebo! The the one thing that does convince me uh, that it could be really serious. In fact, the only thing is. That um, that Trump is is pushing these this isolation because I know he's watching this economy crater right before his election. And he really understands like the American engine and the economy of how strong it is and believes in the workers and really wants people to go to work. I'm going like if that guy is saying, hey, stay at home till April 30th. He must have gotten some kind of a black dossier mm -hmm. because I because I know he'd love nothing more than to find out it was hysteria and come out against it in public and just start going, hey, everybody, this is fake. Go back to work and fight the state and fight culture and everybody. So it, it, it oddly, this man who has very little credibility with me is just from what I know of him lends a lot of credibility to it. Yeah, oddly, I'm kind of glad that he's the president during this than uh, rather than some like power hungry leftist <laughs> yeah. you know because i know he wants the economy thriving so i know this is driving him nuts <laughs> yeah if he's shutting it down i don't think he'd leave he, I, I don't think he'd leave quarantine up a day longer than it absolutely has to be so yeah i'm well, strangely it, trust trustful of that uh that guy it's an odd thing that he is you know uh from the very start fascist 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 and now <laughs> the opportunity to be a he's fascist a, yeah. and he's totally hands off. Yeah, he's not fascist <laughs> enough. That's the big but accusation. The governors right? themselves turn into fascists immediately and get praise for it. It's just a weird thing. Yeah. Should we talk so, about something that's not the coronavirus? <laughs> sure. Let's do it. I'm so tired. I'm happy about to it. do it. <laughs> sure. We got a question from, uh, I don't have his name here, but maybe he'll say it on the recording. So I'll play oh, this. Oh, you have an audio we question. Have an audio okay, question. good. This so is like, do that. Right, great. I love the audio question. Hey guys, oh, audio question. A question with audio. <laughs> okay, here it comes. All right. Uh, any second now. Yep, this is great. This makes a great any podcast. Come on, phone. His phone always pauses, too. Hey, guys, my name is Mike. I wanted to reach out and say I enjoy the show and was pleasantly surprised to learn that you're all brothers in Christ. I followed the work of all three of you over the years, so it was an added bonus. Uh, my question is a bit layered. I'm an 18-year veteran of the Air Force, and I'm about to retire. I've wanted to do art my whole life, but as a man and as a husband, I understand that taking care of family comes first, so I've put off professional pursuit for a long time. With regard to the stereotype of the starving artist, especially since you have families, how has your faith affected the way you approach a fickle industry like art in terms of stability and God's provision? Have you seen a contrast between your experiences and perspectives and that of your peers, both believer and non-believer alike, notably in terms of fear and endurance through hard times? Thanks for your time and for such a fun show. Wow, wow what a good guy. That wow, what a thoughtful human being. Yeah, very Why do only studs <laughs> listen to this show? We have such a great, <laughs> a great audience. It's amazing. <laughs> Oh, unfortunately, because he's a military guy, he probably doesn't have a mullet, but he's been out. So maybe maybe he's grown it. I hope. Yeah, he has. that's a, step one. A mullet of the heart. Yes, he's got a heart mullet. Heart <laughs> mullet. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> All right. So, D Doug, you go because you I think I mean, you both have probably thought way more about this, obviously, than I am, because my mine is not 
an art. Mine is a, a weird craft. You guys are more in the arts, so I defer to you on these. It's it is way more. Mine is mine is also a craft. The business side of it is definitely a craft. So it's very similar to riff tracks and even what what uh, Ethan does with Babylon B and stuff. It's definitely. You don't just wake up and fart around and then wait for the money truck to back in. You're you're always pushing and selling that thing. So mm-hmm. if that's what he's talking about, then I think the biggest thing is that because we're all conservative, the th- if I if I could see something similar in all three of us, because we're conservative, the biggest one of the things that he brought up is what distinction do you have with people who don't have the faith? Um, I mm-hmm. see. Uh, a lot of fellow artists that seem to, it's almost like a NPR PBS thing where like they feel like they're entitled to an art job. So they sit there and complain a lot when things don't go their way. Whereas I'm a conservative. So to me, it's like, I'm not entitled to make a dime. So I have to work extra hard and think very practically and, uh, uh, think of the market and think of uh, salesmanship way more than they do. And I, th- I really do think that's an attitude coming from not feeling like I have it coming to me. Yeah, I, I agree. Ethan, what do you, how, how do you frame that? So I think he's basically saying I've had this, I've lived, a, I've had this career. I've done all this stuff. I've always wanted to do art, but I just have never made the time. Does that seem like what he said? Yeah, and then tying in with the responsibility to obviously to his, family. Feed his family and he has a family, provide. so why be a starving artist? You know, yeah, right. He, he fears the starvation, and we all starve at some yeah. point. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I just anybody that asks me that kind of question, it's always I'm in a weird position because I've I almost feel like I've attained just just enough success to not go back (laughs) but it's like just over the line like i'm always you know like even right now i'm doing children's book illustrations for not that much money winkler for it but it's cool that it's for henry winkler i get to meet and hang out with henry winkler sometimes um it's a great it's it's enough of a paycheck to like pay my bills or to pay my taxes at the end of the year and uh but you know i'm like I, you know, the step from like having to d- go get an hourly job to like, where I'm at is like, it's, it's, it's so close together still. <laughs> I, I yeah, feel like I'm always yeah. hanging on to that. Uh, so, and it's really hard to get there. Like it's, you know, it's not guaranteed. So I always tell guys like that, figure out your window of time where, you know, it's not going to infuriate your wife or make your kids feel neglected that you can take some time and invest some time in it, make it your, make it your hobby. Um, and, uh, but I, I mean, I don't know, like, you know, and set a goal. So, you know, if, if it's a book he wants to write or like a graphic novel, he wants to draw, say, you know, figure out if you wanted to get it done in a year, how many, how much time do you have to work on it each day to do that and see if you can fit that in. But, uh, you said, where other is, than trying so to think, dive into a, new, a career, a new career, that's, that's the thing that freaks me out when guys are like, I've always wanted to do art. So I just, I quit my career and. You know, my wife's a little freaked out right now, but I'm going to start drawing. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> I feel I feel so bad for those guys. I know. Mike, is there yeah. fear or it, concern? There... I should say concern about uh, the money coming in next year. Oh, are you kidding? Yes. Constant always, that. always, always, always. That's the fear. And that's the reason. I mean, he, he puts the faith element in it. I don't know quite where to go with that, because I think that, um, uh, you know, I've, I've seen so many Christians do th- foolish things with their lives. Like we're going to sell our home and get on a bus and go build homes in Mexico. And then they come back a year later disillusioned and their kids are drug addicts or whatever. Like that was, that was not your call that was, you know, that wasn't, you weren't called to do that, although it may seem noble or whatever. And so I'm often puzzled by people doing stupid things where practicality and, um, you know, just, you know, instruction from the Bible to do, you do what you're doing, you know, keep up your thing, but then always, you know, pay tribute. Your, your Lord is Christ. And, and, uh, you know, but keep doing what you're doing. And so making those leaps based on 
uh, any kind of faith thing, I don't think is prudent often. It may sometimes. I mean, sometimes people are called and those things. I'm not denying those things at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that for me, yeah, it's always fear. And the only thing that you can do is work hard. And um, I was blessed to when I was pretty young, I had some success and that's a launching pad. But since then, like both of you, it's been waking up very early, working every single day, really hard, doing other things, hustling to get new things. And that's what we all have to do. And there is no magic period in there where you Mm -hmm. just go. Now I'm inspired. Like I, I have often said, I'm never inspired. <laughs> my my <laughs> no. inspiration is my kids need to eat. That's yeah. my inspiration. And uh, so I, I don't know. Yeah, there, there's no there's no magic there. And so and, so if he's asking for job security, there, there's a there's a normal fear for family men to fear not being an adequate provider. I think that's legitimate. Mm-hmm. That is very legitimate. He, but, he ought to be scared. But I think that nothing provides that anymore. I mean, you used to, you know, you'd work for Johnson and Johnson or something in 1948. And then, you know, 50 years later, you'd retire and your family would be happy. And th- I mean, those things don't exist anymore at any level, do they? Unless you're in government, I guess. Yeah. You're or jo- unless Joe you're Biden in a, or whatever. Well, you're unless fine. you're in a, a big money thing. But I do think because he came out of the military for 18 years, uh, Air Force, thank you for your service. Mm-hmm. He he knows what it's like to get you get paid a little something for doing a little something like a clock and the yeah. art is a different economy because you can do it like a clock and no one wants to buy it there's lots yeah. of stuff i make that people don't want to buy and i work often work way harder for stuff that doesn't pay money versus things that i just fart out and then just there's a big giant check magically appears you know it's it's but but my this is my bigger life thing is don't have anything left on your bucket list when you leave. There's no rule that says you can't do it. Yeah. There probably is an ethic in you as a provider that says, I can't do it at the cost of providing for my family. So maybe you have to get another job, work in the private sector. It's something that someone has to pay you to do that maybe isn't as fun. And then just go crazy on your own time really expressing yourself. I never saw the problem with that because Mm -hmm. if I, because if Ethan, if, if suddenly you never got paid for anything again, would you stop making comics or would you make comics and do a job, get a job? Most of my life, that's what I did. You know, I was, well, up until you were in a band, up until Axe Cop. Yeah. (laughs) Up until Axe Cop. I, I mean, it was really around my early 20s when I decided to start working for myself and I made hardly anything. But, you know, and then even that, you're, you're still doing all this work you don't want to do. Even today, I'm doing work I don't want to do. I mean, it's just, that's just life. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I would, if I had to take on an hourly job, I would definitely carve out time to do my comics or write books or whatever. Right. Just because yep. I have to do it. You know, it's just how I am. No, but I can wither appreciate- away if I don't do it. <laughs> You appreciate this guy's conundrum because of when we all started, or at least when I did, uh, I was unmarried. Mm -hmm. And so anything you do, you could do a lot of stupid, idiotic things. Oh, yeah. Because you have no responsibility other than your idiot self. And so being an (laughs) idiot and doing all sorts of risky things was, uh, you know, in your own mind permitted. I don't think it's wise. I'm just saying you just we all just did it. And so then we. We kind of all hit it when we were young, but I totally understand and appreciate the, well, I'm, you know, now I get out of the service and I have my family. How do I start this? And I, I yeah. honestly don't know, uh, but I'm very sympathetic to that. Totally. How would you do that? Where you're staring at the end of the eyes of your that's, kids going, wait, daddy, now you're going to be an artist. That's a good answer. I understand your plight, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 don't I, I, know. I think that's true. Yeah. I think you can you, you can focus that uh it was one thing I noticed that my my productivity time became much more concentrated once I got married and had kids cuz you know it's so optional when you're single so you can feel really good about yourself when you produced a bunch of stuff you know over a week or whatever but you also spend a bunch of time you know eating hot wings and watching Netflix and hanging out with your friends you just you, you I, have I, to I'd you, skateboard to the laundromat and play skateboard to the laundromat and play Miss Pac-Man for four hours a day when I was a fine artist yeah. and single. And then like, tr- I, could have provided, I could have produced so much more during those, those years than I did. 
I, I did a lot more than most guys, but still I could have done way more. And, uh, you know, now like the time that I get that my wife, you know, allows me and my, my kids know I'm going to be gone. Like if I don't use that well, if I'm just sitting there kind of just, uh, you know, making up some esoteric garbage just to, you know, express myself, you know, I'm wasting their time too. So I need to be really thinking like, what is my project? Uh, is there any marketable, anything marketable about it at all? Is it a thing that I really hope that I'm going to leave behind and my kids will read like a legacy? Like, is this one of my things I have to get done before I die? You know, those questions suddenly yeah. come to the forefront. And I hope that he's, you know, so think in those terms too. I mean, if there's a project you've had in your head to me, yeah, I've, as I've gotten older, that's the way I've started to think about, cause you know, you have all these slots of all these different ideas in your brain and I've started to, uh, I used to primarily think what could be made into a movie, but now I've started to think like, what are the ones that like, I had one of my kids in mind when I came up with it. And I really want them to read it. I want them to remember me by it. And Le- uh, even legacy if, work. Even if they're the one person that reads it, I got to get it done no. for that. And, uh, and, and especially Mike, since you, you may not do, get a career thinking that, I think in those terms. You used to do a thing with your kids and we'll take a sample of that now where you would do this, uh, this English, uh, fiddly, uh, <laughs> oh, say, yeah, yeah, say yeah. nothing prolonged voice. Isn't there a joy in doing that, even though you never got paid, yet it's a seared memory? It's a it's a happy memory. Yes. I, so I'd be driving our van and, and I would do the uh, they would ask me a question like, Dad, where are we going? Well, well, well when 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 one considers where well, one is going, one there are several different paths one can go down. <laughs> one can say, are we really going or when when will one arrive? And, 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 and really, really, there is no question. I mean, it, it is more an issue of are, are we going to arrive at the place or uh, on the other hand? Uh, and again, this splits into three different questions. And, and let's begin with the first one. And the first one is, when we arrive, is one really arriving? This is the thing that we must think. And and number two, uh, if I haven't stated it already, which I believe I have hinted at, but as of yet, I have not gotten to the nut of it. So let's get to the nut of it. Let's crack it open and let's really, really drill down on it. Number two is, once having arrived, have we really, at a certain point, really arrived? I mean, are we present? Are we there? Now, this feeds into, of course, I hear another Gap. Of thought, which, I hear a gap growing in, in between your front teeth the longer you do this. <laughs> and just the kids screaming from the back seat, Dad, answer the question. So if you didn't get paid anything to write and be funny, would you still write and be funny? Is there is there a payment beyond providing for your family, I guess, is what I'm asking. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there, I, I certainly would. I think there's a, a, I think I depressed people when I said this before that uh, they said, like, how do you keep going? How do you keep producing this stuff? And I say, you know, to feed my kids. And they go, oh, that's depressing because I'm an artist and I'm inspired. And it's like, well, I'm inspired. I mean, there's something about that you give up when you go into the profession that you used to do as a, just a pure joy that when you have to, you know, turn it into filthy lucre, like, yeah, there's <laughs> a certain bit of it that's robbed from you. Um, but that's not, but that's true of everything that you yeah. could ever do. And, and you practiced and got great at it without getting right. paid. And, and, and you, you were doing it and loving it even when, there wasn't even payment in sight. You may never yeah. have gotten paid for it. And now you're an expert. So people come to you and say, Ethan, draw. Here's money. And you go, okay, time to turn it on. I can draw. Here's got some money. Mm-hmm. And Mike, you're raising money on Kickstarter for a Rift Tracks thing. And you just go, okay, we're good enough because we did this because we, we loved it. And now we can charge you money. This guy is getting into art. And I don't know if he's good enough to charge money. I would just say find that that thing where you're in love with it and and just start making it because mm-hmm. life is short and you ought to be creating stuff for your kids. You, I already know we're all going to provide for our kids and pay rent. We're going to buy them a potato. We're going to put a roof on their head. They're going to have to have a car. But what will your legacy be? Uh, what I would give to have my uh, something that my I have nothing from my grandfather's. If I could have both my grandfathers who just blogged every day and told me like what they did that day and what they ate, mm-hmm. that would be a treasure to me. I'd study that thing. Yeah. What they thought. 
<laughs> That's true. Yes. <laughs> right. You give anything. I don't even have a picture yeah. of him. And yeah. My like, grandfather was a uh, was a bon vivant. He was this uh, a very gregarious German guy. He he grew up in it's called Geneva, Illinois, and he was the head of the uh, the commerce. Uh, you know what? What do they call the? You know the city commerce. No, it was called the Masons back then. <laughs> <laughs> and he worked for the gas company, um, which you know it was lit by gas back then. Still, there was electricity, hmm. but there was also gas. But he was apparently just a bon vivant and a a big drinker and a. But I know nothing about him. I see just a few pictures of him, and what a gift that would be to go. Like, what was his day like? His Who blog. was he going around yeah. seeing? Mike, I found a comic he made. <laughs> You'd yeah. be like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, even that, like loving Chesterton, having his, like even finding his uh, books where a bunch of his sketches are in, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a different, it's just so cool to see that, you know, there's something, when you see somebody's marks, you know, you see the pressure they yeah. put down and where they lit up and where they messed up. He, and, he, he became our double mentor. We found out he drew. Yeah. Like, we were reading his words and then suddenly like, you know, he can illustrate. And I looked at his illustrations like, what? Now he's <laughs> like my double grandpa. <laughs> yeah. So, <sighs> so leave some tracks, do leave you, some tracks. Do you guys think there is anything to that? Uh, and I, I'm not sure if I remember it correctly, but he, he did make that distinction of, is there any difference from a Christian perspective in this whole thing? And I'm trying to figure that out. I, I, I do think a lot of Christians get like this. Uh, they, they interpret the Holy Spirit as telling them to do art. And maybe that maybe it is. But uh, I think that art can feel that, feel very spiritual because it's like. It does to me. Yeah. It's uh, it's extremely religious to me, and I do think all three of us would be completely different artists if you took removed Christ from our lives. Yeah, I just think the totally I, the outlook, the brightness, the love, even of it, and the love of our fellow. Like I feel like I'm loving my audience when I give them this work. I want to make them happier because I see the image of God in them, and I want to alleviate their suffering with some entertainment. Let's say. And I'm not going to do foul stuff because there's all these compromises that I could make that would be immoral, but might bring in more money or something. I go, I'm just, I'm not, it's too sacred to me. Hmm. I agree 100%. Yeah. I think of that. I've had moments that are almost, um, I don't want to call them, I I don't want to elevate it too rapturous, but I feel so much joy when I hit on a joke that I know, like everyone who hears this, if they understand it, will be a little bit happier and it makes me so happy to think of that mm. and uh and to be able to weaponize comedy is obviously very very easy and to to resist that yeah i would be a different person mm. how about you ethan yeah definitely i mean even I mean, m- most of the stuff i do is out of my own questions and and then also i mean axe cop itself was the reason it exists is because I was meeting with this old prayer warrior in the mornings and his thing he constantly drilled into my head was that family is sacred and, um, you know, and so I, rather than going off and constantly goofing off with my friends, like I would block out lots of time to visit my family and spend time with my siblings who were much younger than me. And a lot of time, you know, when you have a sibling who's 24 years younger than you, you, you generally just kind of, you know, you might see him every once in a while, but you don't have much of a relationship with them. You become yeah. kind of an, an enigma to them. And the whole reason I dove into that relationship was a conviction that like that God had given this to me and, uh, sure. And, and, and really wanting to be a good big brother to him, not to, uh, just, you know, I was, I was not trying to make anything I thought anybody would be into. <laughs> well, and any other artist's adventure is going to be different than ours because yeah. none of us three planned to do what we were doing 10 years before we did it. But do you right. think, like, I guess that's the thing. Like, when I look at other artists that are doing well in the industry, that are just, they're kind of toe the political line. Like, they, they're left leaning and they just, they're perfectly happy to make pure propaganda I, mean, I don't know i don't know if yeah. it's like a too far to say that but like uh i don't know i don't know like is it that there's just they love making the art so much that it's secondary and they're i don't know i don't even know how to say what i'm trying to say i do think there's a difference and all three of us are 
unique content creators. When I need to make more money, obviously I will go and I will, uh, I'll produce veggie tales or I'll do an illustration where someone else tells me what to make. That's Mm -hmm. very different than creating the content itself. I can't imagine spending my life working for another man doing art that he, because he has a wallet and is paying my bills, I have to submit all of my ideas to his filter and do what he wants. Mm -hmm. I don't even do that for my audience. I don't give them what they ask for. I give them what I think they need that I would rather lay brick Hmm. and then go be the madman artist on my own and keep it pure and fun and religious than can see that I don't get why so many artists can see that and basically That's become true. someone else's illustrator. Yeah, I think I may have brought this up before on this, but uh, there's been a few times where I've had really hack ideas where I've gone, this will be successful if I just turn off my don't be a hack thing. Yeah. <laughs> and when I start doing them, it just does not work. Like I'm bad at it. I can't even be a hack because I, it just something kicks in. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good idea. I'm going to turn this into something really good. <laughs> and uh, and and my hackness goes away. I have like a bunch of abandoned projects where like I'm certain this will be a hit. And then I, I can't. Yeah, I just can't do it. It's a weird thing. Yeah, because I should be able to see it through. Like all you have to do is write 30,000 words and turn it in and it's going to be a hit. I'm pretty positive. And I, it, I it probably is just it. a personality type though, it, uh, or a calling. I can't tell the difference, but it's like, uh, we're, we're all three attract each other because we're iconoclasts and rebellious and just not the kind of guys that would rat each other out. You know, <laughs> it's just, uh, I know so many other artists that just aren't that way. Hmm. I don't get it. I don't know it's how they me. do it. I, I mean, in some sense I admire it. Like, wow. Yeah. You just, you just churn that stuff out and uh, it doesn't bother you that you must know that it is not good. <laughs> just throw it right in the middle of a war. Just throw your sharp weapons down and here, hmm. go, yeah. go walk into battle with this dust broom. <laughs> is how I see it. <laughs> That's, that is not. And in a way, I think it's in a way why I suck at art and suck as much as I do is I love it so much that I get so much joy just from doing it. That the ex the the observance and discipline of excellence came much later to me than the love of just doing it. You know, sitting in my room for twenty years was so much funner than before. I when I then when I started getting paid for it, that uh, I still love doing what I do. That's what turns me on, and then I try and trick it into making money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, guys, did we do an episode? Are we? That's an episode. He did it. Yeah. All right. What's done is done. We accomplished it. Well done. Can't go back. This is an audio mullet. This has been audio mullet. (laughs) That's it. I just say it it like Mike, but with more authority. (laughs) We're done. (laughs) Goodbye. Bye, Ethan Beta. Bye, Doug Alpha. Bye, Alpha (laughs) Doug. And I'm Capybara. (laughs) Capybara. Wait, Capybara is a different thing than a chupacabra. Chupacabra. (laughs) I'm a Capybara, though, too. I'm a giant... Uh, South American rat, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, like a, you do yeah. look like a sheep ass. rat. Look at the size of his head. The, that picture of you and Bridget on your tweet thing <laughs> is really is like your head looks enormous. <laughs> he does. Well, thanks, Doug. That's really nice. It's very flattering from my friend. Maybe he just has this a small is still face. An audio mullet. Oh wait, are we still recording? I figured the episode was over. This is post episode banter nope this is in the episode oh. Doug insulting me yeah okay. this is chum okay I'm, I'm stopping my recording audio mullet a mullet of audio smashing you in the face audio mullet short and front long and back it's a fact it's the audio mullet hmm to sit in solemn silence on a dull, dark dock in a pestilential prison with a lifelong lock awaiting the sensation of a short chop chop from a cheap and chippy oh. chopper on a big black block. Okay, good. What Vocal the F was that? <laughs> Vocal warm ups. The theater, <laughs> my dear boy. Funny. The theater. <laughs> Trotting oh the boards. Shakespeare. All right. I feel like All I've right. been just exposed to like a uh, Victorian lounge. Victorian powdered wig beauty mark lounge. Oh, no. If I were there with you, I'd give you a back rub, my dear boy. <laughs> yes, my good man. <laughs> Constable. Right. Constable, will, will you not light my stick?